Well, thank you very much for coming. I want to thank the IIAC and the sponsors of this. And I'm really pleased to see so many people attending and here and curious, interested in learning something about the noise emissions of the turbines. It's kind of a secondary uh, effect of uh, uh, power generation, uh, noise being unwanted sound. Uh, it, it's kind of a waste byproduct from a, from a work process. And uh, what I've been doing the last 30 years is working in uh, noise uh, control and general acoustics. Uh, and uh, the last couple of years really of investigation for me were uh, spurned by a lawsuit that was filed by the residents around the Mars Hill wind facility up in Mars Hill, Maine. Uh, it caught me by surprise. I've been working on other projects at the time. I've been continuing to work on other projects while independently investigating uh, the noise from the wind turbines. And uh, because of travel time and so on and working on my own time on this, I've mostly been looking at wind turbines uh, in the state of Maine, but also looking at some down on Cape Cod and other, other ones close by. I'm a member of an international group uh, with a strong United States presence called the Institute of Noise Control Engineering, or INSEE. And uh, INSEE is a professional organization which is uh, dedicated to the uh, analysis, understanding, and control of excessive noise. Uh, INSEE has a canon of ethics, which is very similar to the, the uh, ethics uh, for professional engineers. And I take this canon of ethics very, very seriously. I have my whole career as a noise control consultant. And the first ethic, uh, the first canon in the canon of ethics is stated, as, as you can see on the screen, hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. It's very simple. Uh, it translates for uh, noise, noise being uh, like politics, a uh, local kind of a situation. Uh, it translates into being a good neighbor. Now, I've, I'm uh, here from Maine. I flew in yesterday. Uh, but I'm actually, uh, in terms of uh, Mainers, I'm actually from away. I wasn't actually born in Maine. I was born up in the upper peninsula of Michigan. So I'm actually a youper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go Michigan. Uh, Here's a picture of a gas uh, turbine power plant. You might not have ever seen uh, what a power plant looks like up close, but uh, we're standing, well, maybe 150 feet away from a, uh, a plant down in the Mel Delmarva Peninsula, which I worked on. And this has some state-of-the-art noise control in it. Uh, I'll point out a couple of things for you with my handy-dandy uh, pointer from the hardware store. Uh, this section right here is an inlet silencer, and it's, it controls the noise that's coming from the combustion section that would otherwise come out the inlet. So it's getting air to burn. It's like a big engine. And, uh, but the noise would come out of this section if it weren't silenced. So we've got a nice big silencer right here. It's kind of a baffled section. You see these sections are sloped down, and they point the if the noise is coming out of it, it sort of points down towards the ground. It doesn't go up. And then in this section up here, this section is a state-of-the-art exhaust silencer. So the, the air comes in, it goes through the combustion section, and it goes out, and it goes up through a silencer, just like a silent muffler in a car, only it's really, really big. And it's handling temperatures of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that, the exhaust goes up the stack and out. Now, I had the interesting privilege for this project of climbing up this stack and measuring the noise level up there. <laughs> it melted the soles of my shoes. I had to run up the last 10 feet or so, uh, hand over hand, and get up there and huddle underneath the, ex the exhaust plume, which was so hot it was going straight up. And I made a couple of measurements and then scooted back down. So that, that was some good fun. So what is the story with noise anyway? Well, it really does boil down to noise is local. It starts at a location, it goes out for a ways, and it dissipates in the atmosphere. This chart is the kind of chart that I used to use. In fact, I designed this chart for use at Stone and Webster back in the 80s 
the, the design, my clever part of this was to figure out how far apart these should be to get an accurate sound power level from a series of sound pressure level measurements. Now I know I'm already over your head with this, but basically this is what a noise meter measures and this is a number sort of like the wattage rating on a light bulb. So this is sort of like lumens and this is watts. And we use dBs for acoustics and I will not get into dBs with you because I don't want to lose you. But basically our ears are compressive. We can uh, take in and, and accommodate an extremely wide range of pressures with our ears and we do so with a series of stages of compression in our hearing. So we can, each one of these little levels, 60, 70, 80, these are, uh, this is 10 times the amount of energy that's coming into the ear. Now what I did, this is a 16 megawatt gas plant, this is another small gas plant, it's called a package plant. Basically it's a, you can ship it in on a, on a truck bed and drop it in a facility and wire it up and it's good to go and it produces about 16 megawatts, and they use it for peaking power. And it makes noise. The, it takes the air in, it puts the exhaust out, it's got some silencing on the inlet, some silencing on the exhaust, but not a whole lot. They're kind of small, and they're right down on the ground. I mean, they're literally no taller than, than the ceiling height here. And uh, typically they get nested in around other stuff at a power plant, and often it's very hard to even measure them from the other noise at a plant. But what I was able to do with this one, which was intriguing, is because it was out a ways from the other uh, units at this plant down in Virginia, I was able to measure what we call sound level versus distance. This is empirical measurement. This is real world stuff. This is not a model. This is the real thing. And it's very handy to measure the real thing because then when you go to another 16 megawatt plant, you know how much noise it's going to put out, give or take a couple of dB, which is about the best that we can do in the real world out in the field making empirical measurements. So with this sort of a chart, I could figure out, well, what's the sound power level uh, based on working back from this set, a very nice set of measurements. And this is also called a walk away. So I'm literally holding the meter like this. I'm going to go out of camera. And I'm just walking along like this while the meter's taking measurements and I'm walking very quietly, so I don't add any noise to the measurement. But what I get is a beautiful line of data points, which I can then use to figure out the characteristic sight sound power level or the effective sight sound power level. In effect, how bright is this light bulb? So when I got interested in uh, the, uh, the wind turbine issue up in Maine, because it had gone into litigation now, this is a serious issue. When a, noise, when, a, when a power plant makes noise that goes into litigation, that means something has not happened. The, the neighbors are being adversely affected, and in general terms, we could say that the power producer is not yet being a good neighbor to the point where the neighbors have actually filed litigation to seek relief. This does happen from time to time with power plants, however, generally, it's a little bit unusual, so it caught my attention in early 2009 when Mars Hill residents filed suit. So I thought, I should go out and measure these. I know how to do this. So I went up to Freedom, Maine, which is about an hour and a half from my house, where I live in Brunswick. And uh, I took my meter with me, and over a series of, of, uh, of visits, about four visits, I made uh, a number of measurements at uh, what we call moderate wind speeds. I had to learn a little about the fuel source, the wind, and, uh, but I knew a lot about how to measure in wind from my previous years of experience so that it didn't affect the meter response because the, the meter is a little bit dumb. It'll just, if there's wind on the meter, it will pick it up. Now you may be noticing a sound while I'm talking. This sound is the noise level right here, it's the noise at about 2,000 feet from the turbines at Freedom, and two of them are running. And I've got it pretty close to about what it was uh, at the uh, facility, uh, best I can do uh, with, the, with the conditions here. 
but typically you've got a, a few things happening. You've got, you've got some low frequency rumble. You've got a, a little bit of whine. You've got this sort of funny swishing sound like a jet that never lands. If you can't hear it, I would be glad to turn it up maybe in the question and answer period. But my intent here with you today is to have you experience this loop of this noise coming in and out and get your ears starting to tune a little bit to this noise. So what I found was that wind turbines, the noise does fall away with distance as we expect. The noise drops, and it drops at a characteristic rate of about what we call six decibels per doubling of distance. That's a logarithmic relationship. And uh, the, however, it's not a clean line. You cannot hear me at all? Should I turn up my uh, microphone? No, it's just in the microphone. Wind sound. <laughs> OK. So I'll use this microphone? No, it's when you turn your head. If your microphone is off to the side and you turn your head this way, we can't hear you. When you turn your head that way, it's a lot louder. Fine. So I should just turn like this. OK, so I'll, I'll do that. That's fine. So what we have then is that the noise drops with distance. Now I understand, we'll start right off here, because uh, these, it, it turns out in freedom, which are the yellow marks, uh, freedom was not regulated by the state of Maine through a kind of a loophole in the uh, regulatory system. So there was no, there's been no state oversight of this facility at, at all. Uh, I also mapped on this chart the green dots, which are from another facility with identical turbines and identical quantity of turbines, uh, three GE 1.5 turbines, and uh, they, the, the results overlay very closely for field measurements. But what we see is that it's not a single number. In other words, if someone says it's going to be this level and then that's it, it, it won't go over that, what I found was that the the, the level of the turbines bounces up and down a lot. And it bounces up and down with, with variations in the wind speed, uh, with variations in the firmware in the, in, in the turbines, I must surmise. It, it sounds like the turbines are hunting for power. A gust will come along, and then the turbines will speed up a little bit. Maybe the, the pitch of the angle uh, of the blades changes, and it starts to uh, bite into the uh, wind a little bit more, almost like changing the angle on an oar if you're rowing a boat. And that is constantly changing. It's very unpredictable. This is not a predictable noise at all. It's, it, it's always changing its character. What we found is that uh, the noise level is fairly flat out for a few hundred feet from the turbines, and then it drops off it, to this characteristic rate for a small facility. And I call this a small facility only in the sense that there are uh, two or three turbines running in this data set. In, in some cases, there are only two turbines running. But you can see the difference up close, re it really makes no difference. The, the, the scatter and the spread is wider than I would expect from the difference between two or three turbines running, because they're spread out some thousand or more feet apart. Now up here, I had measurements coming in much higher because there was a gusty wind above, not down on the ground, but up in the turbines, and they got much, much louder. And what I would expect is that uh, we didn't catch this, this, uh, this amount of wind out at these distances because it died off before we could get this. But what we would expect is that it would drop off also at that characteristic rate. And so the, the, this trend of moderate winds would jump up quite a bit when there were higher winds. So what I'm doing right now is describing for you what I'm observing as a noise consultant about what I'm seeing in, in the real world, in the field. Just basic things. So um, I understand that VESTAs may be uh, proposed for uh, one, two, or maybe all three of the, the projects that are, are being looked at here. And up in Maine, we have a, a facility called the Kibbe uh, Range. Um, and they have uh, a number of uh, Vesta V90s, which are fairly close to the V100s. It's a 90 meter diameter instead of a 100 meter diameter. And they're scattered around uh, in sort of this uh, group on a, a bunch of ridges. 
And I went up there and measured the sound level versus distance from the nearest turbine off the edge of this scattering of turbines. And what I found was that the noise level was definitely above, let's say, 45 dB. Out of, if 1,300 feet might be here, I understand 45 dBA, or how we hear, might have been suggested for uh, as, as an appropriate criterion uh, around here, and that perhaps the noise levels would never go above that. Well, I've measured them going above that a lot at 1,300 feet for uh, similar turbines. And uh, what's interesting is off the edge of a large facility, you don't get 6 dB per doubling of distance. And why is this? Well, as you get far and farther away from wind turbines, the air eats away the higher whooshy whoosh type frequencies, and what's left is the low rumble. And that low rumble is not eaten up by the uh, atmosphere. It's not attenuated. It's, it's not chewed up. So the low rumble stays, and it adds to the noise level from the nearer turbines. And so what we get is it doesn't drop as fast. Eventually, when you get far enough away from this group of turbines, then it would start to drop again at, at six. But there's sort of intermediate range near uh, a group of turbines where it doesn't drop quite as fast. And there's a good example of this from the published data for the Mars Hill facility, which is available on the uh, state of Maine uh, environmental protection website. And these data are the highest hourly sound levels that were measured by consultants like me uh, during evaluation of the post-construction noise measurements, uh, noise levels. And what we can see is that if we're looking, let's say, at, at about a quarter mile, which is about here, we're up in the low 50s. And this is the average level, not the highest level, but this is the, what the average level. And we, here's our 6 dB per doubling, which I expect close in to the nearest turbine because it's going to do what we call control the noise level at the meter. But then as you get further away, we see this emergence of a slowing of the drop with distance. These, the other turbines are adding in. And then I expect that somewhere out here would start to drop at 6 again. It's very hard to get readings out that far. Oh, yes. OK. So um, this is, um, this is, <laughs> this is a, I did this chart last week after analyzing a recording that I did up at Mars Hill in October. Uh, I went up there with my colleague, Steve Ambrose, and we recorded, uh, we stayed overnight, uh, talked with the neighbors, learned about what it's like for them, and then made some <coughs> recordings. And while we were there, uh, I noticed that I was experiencing something like Jurassic Park. There were these booms coming from the turbine facility uh, that I had never heard before, and except in a movie theater. And what's interesting is that Steve did not hear them, but I did. And we're both experienced professionals in this field, and we have different hearing. We're two different people. So uh, what, what I've been doing is looking at the recordings and saying, where is that boom coming from? I know I've experienced this before, and I realized it was in a movie theater. And I finally located it in uh, what we call the 31 hertz octave band. This is a low, deep rumble. And movie producers use energy in this band to give, give a dramatic feel to, to uh, an event, like a dinosaur stomping on the ground. Yes. Let's see. Right. How's that, all right? Does that work better? OK, thank you. What's the time scale on the bottom? This, this is one minute. One minute. So in the space of one minute, I'm getting a, uh, a boom that I'm sort of getting the hair going up on the back of my neck. What is that coming from? And uh, that happened several times. And I analyzed it using, a, we don't really have something quite as detailed as this in the US, but the Poland has a standard for evaluating excess low frequency noise. Uh, which is this level in the 31 hertz octave band. And then there's a German standard, which is a very complicated calculation, which I did. And, and what I did was show when the calculation exceeded the German threshold, 
that would indicate there is excessive low frequency noise. And that seems to line up with the booms, more or less. I mean, I'm getting clusters of these, these uh, exceedances according to the German standard. And then I used another one, which is actually, which actually can be done with meters that we use here in the US, where you measure the, uh, the dBA, the A-weighted sound level, and you measure the dBC, and then you subtract them uh, and see what the difference is. And uh, I interestingly, when the difference is over 17 dB, which is, I think this was recently referenced in some literature, and I may be able to get that for you if you contact me. Uh, when that difference was over 17 dB, uh, when I plot this, it seems to line up very well with the booms. So uh, both from my personal experience and from my interviews with the uh, residents uh, at Mars Hill and the other facilities, and the measurements that I've taken and analyzed, it's very clear that there really is substantial and excessive low frequency noise that can occur near facilities, uh, uh, near wind turbine facilities. So uh, why does this happen? What, what are wind turbines doing uh, uh, that to make noise? Well, they have a uh, an enclosure up at the top of the mass called a nacelle, and they have all their gear in there. This is the power plant right here. And uh, so that the power plant generates mechanical noise, gear noise, whines, things like that. Uh, uh, this, there's a note here that says this whine is predominant with, with small turbines. You don't, that's more noticeable than the aerodynamic noise that you get from the sweep of the blades through the air with the large turbines. There's a, the tonal noise shows up. This is, this is the, uh, this particular uh, uh, recording that I'm playing has a tone in, in one of the uh, octave band, third octave bands, and it's very prominent. In, in the state of Maine, uh, that actually exceeds the limit that they allow for uh, tonal noise uh, content in a particular third octave band. So I've highlighted it to show that a tone can actually be uh, heard and it can also be measured with a standard meter. Uh, the aerodynamic noise comes from offsets in the the perfect angle f of the blade moving through the air to the flow of the air across the blade and it's as I said before it's similar to dipping an oar in the water if you're very good at it like Olympic rowers you watch an Olympic rower and they dip an oar in the water, it's clean. There's, there's no ripple, there's no splash, there's nothing. But it's very hard to accomplish this along the length of the wind turbine blade because the winds are not actually perfectly even along those blades and the blades are moving at a different rate at each point on the blade. Out at, near the center, the, the blades are moving fairly slowly out at the tip, they're moving some 180 miles an hour. At about, 100 and, uh, about 50 meters per second, or about, what's that, 112 miles an hour, something like that, a, something called a tip vortex appears on the end of the blade. And that tip vortex is like this spinning section of air that you saw earlier in that photograph of the uh, ocean wind facility with the condensation streaming off of the turbines, those swirls that you saw coming off are the results of the vort tip vortices spinning off of the blade. Here's a, sort of another illustration of this. As the blade spins around, there is, a, there is a section of air that's tightly coiled that is coming off the tip. It sort of spins down the blade and comes off. Uh, this is to give you some scale in terms of where the blades are and what kind of air they're handling. This is the fuel and, and where we are as human beings. Give you some scale. Down at our sound meter height, which is typically we use five feet, a normal a listening height uh, for, for people, give or take. We're, we're, we're right down in here. That's about it. Trees may extend up. Uh, you guys don't have that many trees out here, do you? But I, I've, uh, I've seen a few here and there. We have a lot in Maine. Uh, but they extend up about this high. The wind turbines start quite a bit higher than that. And in fact, 
uh, in the atmosphere, we have this sort of layer of turbulent air from friction coming across the land that comes up sort of underneath this lower section. The blades are spinning in this other section of air that typically is above this ground or surface layer. That can come up into this area, uh, but typically it's underneath it. There's no real, real given rule about this, and it can change a lot. The atmospherics can vary quite a lot. Um, but as you can see, typically the wind speeds are much higher aloft than they are down on the ground. And in fact, you can often have conditions, especially at night. We've observed this in Maine. I believe it does happen here quite a bit, where you have no wind down in trees or on the ground, and you'll have appreciable wind up here, certainly enough to drive the V100s, which can turn on at, I think, about three meters per second. So, uh, so this is, this, they are operating in a range where you might have very low background levels down where you work and live. Now up in that range though, you can have some interesting things happen. The wind speed can be operating and coming in at different directions based on the height. You can have a different speed depending on the height as we saw in the last chart. And you can also have a common, combination of these speed and direction changes. So when you have those and you're trying to get perfect power delivery through a blade moving through these, the blade is not necessarily going to be able to catch that perfect angle to get a nice, clean, quiet transition through that air as it's coming around. And when that happens, you get variations in noise level. And this is an example. This Again, this is this recording. The noise level is going up and down some, well, in some cases, sort of pausing as the two turbines uh, sort of relax or look for another chunk of air to process and then they get they start working and the noise level will bounce up and down as the blades move to the higher wind speed at the top drop down to lower wind speeds and you get this whoosh and that's the whoosh at 2,000 feet tends to control or shape the sound signature for the A weighted sound level. So I want to pause for just a second and imagine that you're in a deep, quiet night. There is nothing going on. You're not near a highway. Work's done. People are home for the evening. And they've gone outside to get a breath of fresh air, got their parkas on, their hats, their mittens, and they're standing outside their house. This is what you might get, minus that. But this is what you get next to a wind turbine facility. You won't have that deep quiet. It's gone. In Hull, Massachusetts, they've had aircraft flyovers for a generation. There are people there who've grown up not knowing what deep quiet sounds like. They're psychology has shifted to accept a higher sound level. This is a picture in Hull, Massachusetts of, the, of a jet taking off from Logan and flying over a household. So now, what do we do with the noise? What, what makes sense for being a good neighbor when you're designing a power plant? Now, most of us never even have to get into the business of designing a power plant. In years gone by, it's been done by engineering firms. And I worked at such a firm, Stone and Webster Engineering, one of the largest ever uh, while it was operating. And we typically designed to no more than sporadic complaints. And the reason was our clients, utilities, didn't want lawsuits. Lawsuits are very expensive. And if a judge decides to shut down the facility while they're trying to work out the problems, that can be very, very expensive. The daily income from that facility is lost. So how do people react to noise? Because that will tell us a lot about how to design a facility to be a good neighbor. Well, typically, what we see is that when the noise is the same as that we're used to, we don't have a reaction. 
If the noise is coming in about five decibels higher, we can get sporadic complaints. We can notice the sound. When it's about 10 dB higher, typically it feels about twice as loud, and we can get widespread complaints. That means perhaps a quarter of the population or more are having a problem with it. Now, when you get complaints, the people who complain out loud are not the entirety of the population that are bothered. Some people will button up their lip and try to put up with it. But the people who complain are, are the visible surface evidence of a real problem. Uh, you get 15 dB higher, you've got threats of community action. That means people may have contacted their attorney. They have reached a level of in, it's intolerable for them. They, they want something to change but they haven't yet reached the point where they're going to take serious action. At 20 dB, there is serious action. That usually involves either litigation or some very pressing interaction with the noise producer to change the problem. Now, this is true for bars. It's, it's true for highways, uh, airports, any large noise producing source that's creating a noise that's objectionable for nearby residents. So in the early 70s, following the work by the Air Force in the 50s to, to create a, a kind of a scaled, stepped approach based on this 5, 10, 15, 20 dB approach, the Air Force did it, created a siting <coughs> manual for siting airports so they wouldn't have problems. And the EPA uh, drew from this, and the EPA also uh, determined the noise level that people are experiencing all over the country. Now, it, you won't be able to read this graph, but what, what it does is it shows in, uh, in a number that I'll explain in a second. These are the number of people in millions. So this is 10 million people. This is 100 million people. And this is the entirety of the population in 1974, about 214 million people. And the lowest noise level they went to is about 20 dB. So they figured the people out in the farthest reaches of the wilderness, say in uh, Idaho, for example, they're going to have very low sound levels. And then as you go into the urban areas, the sound level goes way up. And you have progressively fewer and fewer people exposed to much, much higher sound levels. The mandate for the EPA was to figure out what guidelines to set to, to protect uh, the public welfare. And so they had not just an engineering issue, but a political issue. They had to find a number that would work because it was going to cost money to address it. So I've zoomed in on this middle portion and uh, kept uh, the, from 1 million people up to the 214 million people. And what the EPA settled on for their guideline in 1974 is called LDN 55. That means a day-night sound level of 55 where the night sound level is 10 dB lower, and that's, guess what, 45 dB. And for the people who are experiencing noise levels that are higher or much higher than that, that is definitely a relief. There, at that time, there were 10 million people experiencing daily sound levels of over 70 during the day and 60 at night. That's, that's loud. And so this was a, a very appropriate measure, a very appropriate guideline to suggest uh, as a target to start reducing the noise levels in the country. And from this spawn things like the staging of aircraft noise. The aircraft are now much quieter than they were in the early 70s. And there are mandates for truck noise, the gradual reduction of truck noise over time. However, this 55 day, 45 night is not at all appropriate when you get down into rural areas like Riga Township. Because out here, in the, if you're not near a highway and you're not near a large ethanol plant, the background sound levels during the day might be 35, mid 30s, somewhere in there. Uh, might be mid 20s, maybe lower at night. Uh, I live in one of the densest populations in Maine, Brunswick, uh, maybe 10,000 people or so. I can walk outside at night, and we have trees. We've got all kinds of things. At night, I can, my, I can hit the noise floor in my meter, which is about 18 dB. 
if there's no wind in the trees and I can't hear uh, Route 95, it's quiet. And this would equally be true for any rural area when you're not near a large noise source like a highway or an industrial facility. So the EPA, although they weren't entirely explicit about this in their so-called levels document of 74, in 77 they were a little bit more um, articulate about what they meant by the 5545 because there were complaints coming in, for example, about aircraft impacts on national parks. And what they wrote was uh, that they wanted to encourage uh, federal, state, local agencies to adopt a, a noise policy designed to prevent degradation of existing noise levels. In other words, they didn't want state and local le uh, uh, agencies to sort of get the wrong idea and adopt 5545 when it was quieter. Because what they said was their, recomm their recommendation or their guideline was not a standard. It was not a mandate. It was not a statute. It was simply a first step toward reducing noise levels in the United States. And so what they said in 77 was that a non-degradation policy could be incorporated into uh, land use planning in an effort to reduce potential increases of noise levels. And that's the kind of thing that could happen here if, a, if a, uh, a standard such as 45 dB at 1,300 feet were adopted because the background noise level is already much lower than that at night. Although I have not yet measurement, measured it, I would expect it to be in the low to mid-20s at night. That's an increase of 20 dB. Now, from my previous slide, what does that suggest? That suggests litigation. Now, in a number of times in my career, I have actually seen litigation precede the facility being built. Not because people had gone out and measured the background sound level and done the calculation and figured out, oh, well, this will go up 20 dB, I must sue. No, what has happened is that people have an innate understanding of their quality of place people who own homes and live where they live. And there's this funny thing that happens. People actually respond to facilities that are going to degrade their natural environment before it happens. And I've seen it more than once. So in the 1974 levels document, the EPA, in its wisdom, provided a way to figure out if noise would be objectionable. And they did this by studying 55 facilities, all kinds of different facilities. And uh, they, they, uh, they normalized the data by relating it to the background sound level. And then grouped it into the, the severity of the complaints that had been observed at these sites. This is empirical work. This is sort of down-to-earth science. How are people actually relating to real plants? And what they found was that there's a, there's a relationship, understandably enough, between the sound level and the response. As the sound level goes higher, the response gets stronger. And again, they were working here with that day-night sound level. And this graph is normalized to resi residential urban. Now, Riga is not residential urban. None of the counties around here are. Toledo could be residential urban. If you own a home in the residential section of Toledo, that might be residential urban. Residential urban has things like aircraft flyovers. It has this pervasive soft background din of traffic from cars driving all the time, day and night. Maybe not nearby, but maybe 500 feet down the block, a mile away, and so on. And all of those cars, thousands of cars, sort of add up to this background din that occurs in urban areas. And the people there do not have the same expectation of quiet that people in places like Maine and Riga Township do, where it's quiet at night. So uh, what I did with my colleague Steve Ambrose, who's a member of board certified of NC, we've worked together some 30 years now, is that we thought, well, we should take the 
EPA method and turn it into something that people could understand when they hold up a meter or when they read a noise prediction and the, people's, the, the, the uh, application says, well, this is what the noise level is going to be. And what we did was we normalized it to a year-round operation in a quiet rural community. All of these adjustments for these normalizations are in the EPA document. And uh, uh, I can, you can write to me. I will send you the papers that I've done on these things. Uh, we also, I also have some on my website at randacoustics.com. Uh, that outline how this works. It's actually very, very simple. Uh, you don't have to be an acoustician to do it. You just have to have an understanding of what the community character is. Uh, is, the, is the noise source going to operate year round? And does it have, uh, are, have people had prior experience with the noise? For example, in, in Hull, they have had prior ex experience with off the ground aerodynamic noise, aircraft. So they, when a wind turbine comes in that makes that same kind of aerodynamic whooshing from the vortices spinning off the blades, that's not news to the people in Hull. They've heard this for a generation. And then is there tonal or impulsive character present? And as I showed you earlier, wind turbines are definitely capable of producing an impulsive character. And they also, they create tone. So when, with these adjustments, and then converting to what we call the equivalent sound level, which you would also understand as the average sound level, like I was showing with my trends, not the maximums or the minimums, but the average, then we can see what is the community reaction going to be in a rural area. So what is it? Well, if we look at 45, which has been suggested at a quarter mile for Riga Township, a quiet rural area, what we see is that we are predicting strong appeals to stop the noise or moving right to litigation. And if we look at lower noise levels like 40, we've got widespread complaints. At 35, we have sporadic complaints, maybe widespread complaints. At 33 and down, we have no more than sporadic complaints or we have no reaction. And this is because Raga is quiet. And you have no experience with this kind, of in, this kind of noise. And it has a specific character, which is unusual. And we hear it. Whether we like it or not, we're going to process that sound to figure out if it's speech or if it's a hazard for us, if it's dangerous. So what have other researchers found with wind turbine noise? Well, uh, two Swedish researchers found through a uh, community uh, study that the percent of people who are highly annoyed, that means that they are experiencing activity interference. They want to read a book in the evening, but this noise is bugging them. Or they want to sleep at night, but it wakes them up. Or they want to sleep at night, but they can't get to sleep or they want to sleep at night, but they are afraid to go to sleep because it might wake them up later. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, examples of, of uh, activity interference. Well, they find that they found that wind turbine annoyance starts in the low 30s. And it ramps up very quickly compared to the kinds of noise sources that we are familiar with, trains, planes, and automobiles, which uh, where annoyance starts up in the low 40s and then ramps up a bit more slowly. Aircraft is uh, the most similar to wind turbines, interestingly enough. They have uh, approximately the same kind of sound. They, they make this aerodynamic whooshing sound. This study was with pretty small turbines, 150 to 650 kilowatts in size. But I will say this, these turbines have tip speeds that are over 50 meters per second. So these turbines were generating those tip vortices. Why is this so much steeper? Well, there's no general agreement on it, but people think, in my, in my neck of the technical woods, think that it's because there is a low frequency, conduit, uh, low frequency content, and it has this very unusual, unpredictable character that people can't get used to. So does this 
kind of assessment based on the EPA method published in, in 1974, does it work? Well, what we did was we graphed the, the Pedersen and Way reactions, of, or the amount of people in the community that were highly annoyed, we mapped those into the range of reactions, and then I plotted the actual reactions at the three sites uh, in Maine, Mars Hill, Freedom, and Vinyl Haven. Both Mars Hill and Freedom went into litigation. Mars Hill is, has been in litigation, will have been in litigation now for two years, I think, in March. And Freedom went into litigation. They spent over $55,000 from their own savings accounts. These are the nearby residents trying to get some assistance from the local uh, regulators, uh, the planning boards, the, uh, from the, and from the state and from the Board of Environmental Protection, and they were ultimately denied. So the facility has continued to operate. The people there have been unable to sell their homes. Some have moved away. This is true in both, both facilities. Mars Hill, I understand there are people who have tried to sell their homes or want to but haven't even tried because they don't see any point to it. Vinyl Haven is an island off the coast of Maine. They, they recently installed three turbines similar to Freedom, and they are currently, I believe, headed toward litigation. They have retained an attorney. They have filed formal complaints with the state. They are in a kind of a give and take process with the state. The facility has worked hard to try to resolve the complaints. They've done very complex studies of uh, what are called noise reduction options. They didn't have a satisfactory outcome from that. They didn't find a significant improvement with those so far. And they have had strong appeals to stop the noise. They have had, within, within a certain distance, widespread complaints. And this is typically within a half a mile, quarter mile, definitely, some perhaps out to a mile. But this is it. Noise is local. So then I took these uh, categories, which are, uh, let's, uh, let's go back, I took these categories, vigorous community action, strong appeals to stop the noise, widespread complaints, sporadic complaints, and no reaction, and I plotted them as bands for the noise levels where these occur for people who live in rural areas, and then labeled them like this. So now we can look at noise level versus distance which I love. I love sound level versus distance because that tells the story of how, f how large the locale is. Where does noise stop being an issue? Well, at Mars Hill, these dots are actually near residents. And these, these are the noise levels, the highest hourly noise level that we saw earlier, the average noise levels, not the maximums. And we can see very clearly from this chart that there is a very clear correlation between the noise levels and the predicted reaction uh, from the community. And the noise levels don't drop down into where we'd like them to be from a design standpoint. I want to design that no more than somewhere in here. We don't really get there for a, maybe a couple of miles out at Mars Hill, maybe two, maybe even three miles, but definitely definitely over two miles. At Freedom, which is a, has three 1.5 megawatt turbines, here's our characteristic line with distance. And we have to get out to essentially a mile before we're in the range, a good design range, to be a good neighbor where we're getting no more than sporadic complaints. I don't want to design to widespread complaints. I don't want to design to strong appeals to stop the noise or vigorous community action. This is not a good neighbor in here. This is where you start getting into good neighbor territory out here. You're not bothering people who live nearby. Same thing with Vinyl Haven. These are all re residence uh, locations. These, again, these are the moderate winds, not the highest winds. These are nowhere near the highest levels that they've measured. And what we see is, again, we have to get out to about a mile before we get into sporadic complaints territory. Uh, here's another facility. This is down in Falmouth, Massachusetts. This figure was published by 
uh, uh, an, an acoustic firm who was hired by the town to study the noise levels at a nearest neighbor, oh, well, actually to, in, a, in a whole range of locations, uh, around a wind turbine that started up there, a Vesta's V82. This is sort of the small uh, cousin of the V100. This is a smaller unit. I think the blade control might be the older, older model stall control versus pitch control, but these are, these are the kinds of uh, noise levels that we see from this, this particular turbine. Uh, the range at 13, amazingly, 1,300 feet, quarter mile, uh, 34 to 51. These are 10 minute minimum sound levels from the wind turbine. The orange dots are without the turbine operating, and these are the background sound levels in Falmouth, Massachusetts, and they're in the high 20s. This is sort of what I expect for that area. So it's a little bit more densely settled, and they have a, a fair amount of uh, traffic in, in, on a couple of roadways, but this is not unusual for a not quite a rural area. This is sort of what I expect, so mid to high 20s. But the turbine comes very, in very clearly, about 34, maybe clusterings in the mid 30s, and comes up here. These people have hired an attorney. They are, they are in serious negotiations. They have filed formal complaints. These noise levels for them are very excessive. So I map those noise levels to uh, this chart to see uh, what was going on. And it kind of makes sense. At sometimes, maybe at the quietest times, the turbine could be a good neighbor. Down at the very lowest levels, it's right at the edge of sporadic complaints. It never gets down into the no reaction area at 1,300 feet. Typically, it's going to be in widespread complaints, and some portion of the time, it's going to be at noise levels that are up in the strong appeals to stop the noise and vigorous complaints category. Again, this is not good neighbor territory up here. So how does this relate to public health, which is one of my main concerns as an INSEE member? If I'm designing a plant, or if I'm looking at a plant design, I, I look at it critically and think, is this going to protect public health? Is this design, uh, does this make sense? Is it sensible? Well, we have some interesting uh, data that's come up from a uh, doctor up in Maine, Dr. Michael Nissenbaum. This is uh, preliminary data. I understand he's going to be issuing a, a peer-reviewed uh, report at some point this year, perhaps. But these are the salient points that he uh, outlined uh, uh, last year. Uh, what he did was he, he looked at the health of uh, residents close to the wind turbines in Mars Hill, and he looked at a group of people who were far away from the turbines and had, had no energy coming from them at all. And he found substantial differences between the two groups. And so this is kind of a, a, a medical field study with a control group with people who have been exposed and people who are not exposed. And what he found was that he found sleep disturbance and sleep deprivation and multiple illnesses in his medical uh, uh, assessment that cascade from chronic sleep disturbance, including cardiovascular disease and metabolic disturbances up to diabetes. These are things he has measured. He found psychological stress, which can result in additional effects. This is from the undiluted neuroendocrine response to a stress. We, we can control our reactions to things, but not necessarily when we're asleep and wake up from a, an audio disturbance. But these stresses can result in additional effects, including cardiovascular disease, chronic depression, anger, and other psychiatric systems, symptoms, and these are in, in his opinion as a medical doctor, so I'm simply relaying these things to you. Uh, he found increased headaches. He found adverse changes in weight, which people did not want. He found auditory and vestibular system disturbances. These are things like people are dizzy. And he found an increased requirement for and use of prescription medication you know, to feel better. Now, these are all medical consequences of living near the turbines. The people were there before the turbines, the turbines came in, and we, he found that these things were occurring for those people. In his recommendations, 
he said he found a high probability of significant adverse health effects for residences located within 3,600 feet. He also found a significant risk of adverse health effects. They likely occur out to at least 2,000 meters, and he recommended 2,200 meters of separation between a residence and the nearest turbine. So let's take those distances, 3,600 feet, uh, roughly 7,000 feet, and go back to our Mars Hill, which is where he studied. Here's 3,600 feet here, and here's 7,000 feet here. And so he's getting down close to about 40 dB or so as a minimum separation distance based on the actual measured noise levels. That would, that's his minimum recommendation. So he would like to see farther distances than that. We'll get back to this. Now, there are other substantiations of this EPA normalized method for assessing community reaction to a noise source. At the Kibbe facility in Maine, it's very remote, and the nearest residences are well over a mile away. We have seen no reactions from the residents that are up there. I think they may be as far as two miles away, about 10,000 feet. At Vinyl Haven, the neighbors that are farther than a mile away, uh, the, the village where most of the people live is some seven miles away from the turbines. They have no reaction at all to the wind turbines. In fact, there's a, it seems from my understanding that they don't understand what the problem is. At, in Hull, Massachusetts, they are under the Logan flight path, uh, the southeastern flight path, and they have daily exposure to aerodynamic noise and urban noise levels. And so they have a previous exposure to the same kinds of noise. They have no expectation of quiet. And so they have, correspondingly, uh, a working, they can, you can work with a shorter distance to have no reaction from that community. And, and they've had no complaints. So I can summarize by saying that, uh, and I can get into these technical details about the noise control options, because what I wanted to do is present to you the community reaction side to this. I can tell you that in, I've read dozens of wind turbine applications or uh, uh, different submittals for approval either on a local or state level, and I have not seen the kind of community assessment that I've shown you here. And this is the kind of thing that we would normally do first to help our clients understand uh, what kind of thing that they'd be working with, what kind of distances they might have to work with, or what kind of noise control they'd have to work with in order to be a good neighbor. I have not seen that in the wind turbine applications. It may be there, but I haven't seen it. So I can summarize by saying that only reliable noise control options I've found so far is sufficient separation distance set during permitting. Because once they're in, they're in. They're not <coughs> going to be moved. Uh, if they go in at a specific distance, which is a problem for nearest neighbors, the only reliable noise control option, option that I have found is shutdown. I have not seen noise control, uh, noise reduction options, these, you know, pitching the blades a certain way or changing them or slowing them down at night. I haven't seen evidence that uh, submitted by wind uh, industry that shows that those work reliably. The best test I know of was done at Vinyl Haven. They didn't find anything significant for it. So that's my basic presentation. I want to thank you very much for listening and for coming and, and digesting this technical information.